A few people have asked me over the years, if the E2s were so rubbish, why did they survive until 1963? And to be fair, that's a really good question, which I think has a more complex and interesting answer than just because they were good. Because if anything, they, like most of the other pre-grouping southern machines that lasted that long, seem to be just... fortunate owing to complicated circumstances. Fortunate? Let me try and explain without prejudice or bias, as this will probably be the nearest we'll come to a version of slips about types of engines which no longer exist. And once you see the limitation of photographs and film clips at my disposal, maybe you'll see why I hesitate pursuing it. The E2s came about in 1913 as the first new engines under Lawson Billington, RJ Billington's son. The intention was to replace the old Stradley E1s from 1874 on light goods trains and the occasional shunting turn. Two of them were tried out on passenger trains between London Bridge and Crystal Palace in South London in 1914, but these really weren't a success. The locomotives weren't balanced very well, so they had a tendency to oscillate back and forth, which in turn made the carriages oscillate and gave the passengers an uncomfortable ride. When you're running commuter trains, the last thing PR people need is more fuel to add to the fire of grumbling commuters. Not only that, their fuel capacity proved insufficient for even short journeys. This led to the next batch of five having extended water tanks, taking their capacity up to just over 1,200 gallons. But the marriage of boilers from L2 Atlantic tanks and high-pressure cylinders seemed to remain an unhappy one, as no more than five E2s and five E2Xs were built by 1916. The ten locomotives ended up being delegated to shunting and banking duties in southeast England, with some of them ending up in Southampton docks alongside the USA tanks and a smattering of other obscure pre-grouping locomotives. They boasted a tractive effort of £21,305 and had a 16-foot wheelbase, so while they had sufficient shunting power, albeit not as much as an austerity or a pannier or even a USA tank, they were incapable of going round the tightest curves at Southampton docks. Bear in mind an austerity with an 11-foot wheelbase was also tried out and proved unsuitable, while the USA's with a 10-foot wheelbase proved to have just the right balance of strength and flexibility. Eventually the E2s ended up being withdrawn between 1961 and 63, with none surviving into preservation and their legacy only immortalised for the rest of eternity by Thomas. For the benefit of those of you curious about what footplate crews had to say about them, the following testimonies come from H. Norman's footplate days on the Southern, recalling the post-war years when he fired E2s around Hearn Hill in Kent. The claims of oscillation are backed up when he recalls the ride comfort at 50 miles an hour. With 4 foot 6 inch driving wheels, this was going some, and the resultant lurching and swaying had me hanging onto the cab side somewhat grimly. As stated before, the boiler came from the L2 tanks of 1908. These engines lasted a little over 20 years due to the inadequate design of the boiler. In the words of H. Norman, it was an adequate shunting engine boiler, but nothing more. And sure enough, on one of his banking turns, the E2 he was on lost about 40 pounds of pressure within three quarters of a mile. Bad ride and poor boiler kind of implies they weren't very good on the short distance goods trains they were intended for. Some of the E2s were fitted with condensing apparatus to cool the exhaust steam down and turn it back into water, thus overcoming their insufficient water capacity. Unfortunately, this condensing gear didn't cool the steam down so much as warm the existing water in the tanks up. Once the water dropped below a certain level, it would get so hot that the filler caps on the tanks became too hot to open. Not only that, but the warm water would force the injectors to stop working. Great. Then there's the regulator, which in the style of other Billington locos, such as Billington Senior's E4, stretched out across the width of the cab in such a way that the lower half would intrude on the fireman's space when he was shoveling coal. So if the fireman didn't watch his back, he would occasionally turn into Bishop Brennan. He did kick me up the ass! I will own up and say I was wrong about the brakes. Or at least half wrong. According to H. Norman, the Westinghouse air brakes were so sharp that during shunting, couplings would snatch apart and allow wagons to break away. But the whole principle of using a six-coupled tank engine on loose-coupled goods trains is doomed from the start. They may have a few more tons to their name than a 5700 pannier tank, but the E2 still only had three axles worth of stopping power. Tender engines would generally have twice the braking capacity for this kind of work, so it's fair to say the E2s were likely worse on goods trains than the Chatham Cs or the Billington Ks or the Monsell Ns. The whole selling point of those stories was that they were usually based on real events and practices, don't forget. The nearest Mr. Norman comes to praising the E2s in his book is saying that he spent the most number of individual days working on one. Most people under 18 would have spent the most number of individual days in school, but I'd be surprised if people praised that time very much. So how did the E2s last until the 1960s? The thing is, 
All remaining Brighton Line locomotives ended up in the hands of a company with modern dreams but low contingency. Upon the 1923 Grouping Act, the London Brighton and South Coast Railway was absorbed into the Southern Railway, who adopted the London and South Western's plans for electrification. These had been proposed prior to World War I, and in the 1920s the Southern Railway put these plans into action, electrifying the main routes from London to Brighton, Portsmouth and Hastings via Tunbridge by 1939. The aim was to electrify the whole Southern Railway network by 1963, by which time the most recent steam types would reach the tail end of their working lives and chances are the elder ones would have been withdrawn by then anyway. Unfortunately, some frustrated Charlie Chaplin lookalike from Austria seized a chance for world domination and the civilian electrification scheme had to go on hold. What did this have to do with the E2s? Well, indirectly at least, while it was laying down the juice rails closer to London, the Southern's plans for new steam locomotives in the 20s and 30s was to largely run most pre-grouping types into the ground and prioritise the construction of big express engines for long-distance trains to the southwest of England, hence the abundance of King Arthur's and the 16 Lord Nelsons. Keep in mind the Southern Railway was the smallest of the big four and dealt with the least amount of goods traffic, having no mass of collieries, car manufacturers, fish, iron, steel or textile industries to serve. The LMS built over 700 new steam engines in the 1920s and 30s for goods traffic across the 4F, 7F and 8F classes, as well as over 400 steam shunters and more than 100 diesel shunters. In those two decades the Southern built 45 goods engines, 8 steam shunters and 3 diesel shunters. Even though local goods traffic was commonplace and Southampton docks ended at more than 500 acres in size, less emphasis on goods traffic means the replacement of shunting engines was very low down in the Southern Railway's pecking order, meaning it was more cost effective in many cases to just keep what they had regardless of their suitability, capability and reliability. The Drummond C14-220 tanks were delegated to dock shunting alongside the Adams B4s because there wasn't money for a fleet of new shunters to subsidise the Adams engines. The Chatham P-Class, initially intended for push-pull trains, only ended up as shunters because they proved good for nothing else. So while a little demand might have been there to replace some of the old pre-grouping designs in minor roles, the backing from higher-ups who wanted a modern passenger-carrying railway... wasn't. Then World War II came around, and that messed a few things up. With the electrification scheme suddenly on hold, the Southern's chief mechanical engineer, Oliver Bullied, realised there was no contingency plan and ended up having to build another 213 locomotives to new designs over a 10-year period. Or, to put it more accurately, 212 locomotives and one mistake. Once again, the role of shunting was mostly overlooked, only to be seen to with the construction of 27 diesel electric shunters and the purchase of 15 second-hand S100 switches. But, once again, this proved to be mostly insufficient. Why didn't the Southern buy more USAs? Because the cost of 15 was the equivalent of nearly one and a half million pounds and there simply wasn't money for more. Bullied designed a similar steam shunter to the S100, but the cost of building a new one of these was twice as much as buying an S100 second hand. By the 1950s, the existing members of the Southern Railway's pre-grouping fleet were slowly being replaced by the BR standards and the Ivor 2MTs. Anything that survived, such as the E2s, were just living on borrowed time. No new steam shunters had been built for the Southern since 1929, and by the late 1950s, British Railways was pushing ahead with diesel equivalents only. The writing was on the wall for the E2s, and between 1961 and 63, their lives ended. To anybody who says at this point, why didn't someone consider preserving one because it'll be nice to see it now? Sometimes locomotives that we consider charming nowadays weren't necessarily popular and sought after at the time. Keep in mind, when the Bluebell Railway Preservation Society wanted a second engine to go alongside Stepney for their reopening in August 1960, their first choice wasn't a Chatham P-Class as it wasn't considered sufficient for the job at hand but ended up being their reluctant choice because needs must. So the E2s were around for 50 years, which as far as steam locomotives go, is commendable. But what people often tend to overlook is their predecessors, the E1s, were around for 87 years, and the Terriers before them, 91 years. It's easy to say the E2s were brilliant because they lived for so long, that is, 17 to 19 years longer than the A4s, but longevity isn't necessarily the first sign of quality. If that were the case, then Simon Cowell would be considered a better contributor throughout music history than Janis Joplin, Kurt Cobain, Bob Marley, Buddy Holly, Beethoven, Mozart, Joe Strummer, Whitney Houston, Otis Redding, Jimi Hendrix, Elvis Presley, John Lennon, Amy Winehouse, Prince, Chester Bennington, Jim Morrison, Dee Dee Ramone, Glenn Miller, Chris Cornell, George Harrison and Freddie Mercury. Imagine Simon Cowell getting more praise than all of these people just because he was lucky not to have died before they did. Here's the thing. 
If people like the E2s, whether it was the basis for Thomas or not, that's perfectly fine. It doesn't make them bad people, and I don't think the worst of them. And Thomas himself, despite the embarrassing excess that comes with him, which no rail fan can shake off, is perfectly fine. I don't think he's bad, I don't think he's rubbish, I don't think he's shit, I don't think he's hateful, I think he's fine. But factually and historically speaking, it's fair to say that Steam technology has peaked much higher. And that's the closest you'll get to me reviewing a type of engine that no longer exists, simply because it no longer exists. If somehow you didn't get bored at looking at the same film clips and photographs over and over again and you'd like me to do more of these, then by all means let me know in the comments. But keep in mind the inconsistent quality of limited resources might make the end result look a bit underwhelming compared to what can be achieved with preserved types of locomotives. I'm Chris, and I'm here to gauge the issue.